Welcome to Metro. My name is Seth Connerly. It's great to have you with us as we continue and more specifically wrap up this series called Nightmares. And uh, it's been a, a ride. I don't know about you, but the idea of week in and week out talking about fears uh, is both enlightening but uh, deeply exhausting at the same time uh, because fears by their very nature can feel like they're sucking the life out of you, right? Uh, and we've talked about some real weighty ones over the course of the last few weeks we've had together. Everything from the fear of failure, which I think any of us have wrestled with at any point in time, uh, the fear of death and the fear of the future and the unknown and not knowing what is coming next in, in life and all those things. Uh, we've talked about loneliness and the idea that we weren't made to be alone, but that fear, that difficulty of feeling that is very real, and at any given point in time in our lives, we've all experienced that equally. Now, to that end, uh, I've done numerous series like this over the years, uh, or in numerous individual talks similar to this as well. We talk about fears and struggles that are similar to that, and so that's not uncommon for uh, to, to occur, but what I would say is, is that the subject matters we've covered have fairly rhythmically found themselves in a placeholder within that uh, different talks and whatnot. But today I'm talking about one that I've never talked about when it comes to fear before, uh, and that's mostly due to the fact that I've probably avoided it. That's probably the main reason that I've done that, uh, because it's a very real problematic thing in any of our lives, and it's the idea that we are fearful of losing control over our lives and not being in control of our lives. Not like fear of losing control, like, wow, like not, not like that at any given moment, although maybe for you, that's one. You're like, Seth, I'm at my limit. Like, maybe that's you, but that's not what we're talking about today. It's that idea that security and worry and all these other problematic things that stir within us inadvertently and at times subconsciously or consciously for that matter can push us to a place where we believe that we have to have control over our situation and our circumstances and the problems that face us, our relationships, our workplace, our whatever. And we go, man, I just got to have control. If I could just get a little bit more, uh, wrap my arms around this thing and really get it under control, under wraps, I think I'll be secure in where I'm at with it. I think I'll feel at peace. I think that I'll be able to move forward successfully. I'm going to tell you right now, it doesn't pan out real well. And you want to know who it really doesn't pan out real well for? Not specifically you, but the people you care about most tend to be the ones that are collateral damage in instances of problematic and unhealthy control. I mean, there's a little word for it, right? We talk about it being a control freak. Now, the idea of what it means to be a control freak or someone who is desperately in need of control of their situation manifests quite differently for each of us. And we're going to be looking all throughout Scripture uh, to see what it is that God has to say about control, where it comes from. Uh, are there things we should allow to control us? What should we release control to? What should we wish to control, if anything, and what does that need to look like? And there's all sorts of instances throughout Scripture that speak to each of these. But as we prepare for that, and we're going to be starting in Isaiah uh, verse 50, or excuse me, chapter 55. If you want to go ahead and be turning there, you can do so. But as you're doing that, I want to prepare us uh, by making you do a little bit of an internal deep dive into how you specifically may struggle with control. Because when I do that blanket statement of control, that in and of itself, I think is something we do a disservice to because we don't really get specific with how you or I individually deal with that. Let me be more clear. Uh, our personalities shape the way in which control manifests in our lives. Uh, I don't know about you, but I love doing personality tests and studies and all that. It, it's incredibly helpful, not only for personal self-awareness, but by interacting with people and knowing how to love them well and meet them where they're at. Uh, my favorite one of all is the DISC test, so the D-I-S-C is what it is. Uh, there's all kinds of different manifestations of it. It's arguably one of the most common. Uh, Gary Smalley's personality test is the exact same. It's just with animals, lion, otter, retriever, beaver. Uh, there's another one that's colors, which is red, yellow, green, blue, uh, all these ones like that. The reason I like this one is because it's only four. That's why I like it. It's simple. I can handle it. It's not 16 like the Myers-Briggs test, which is incredibly helpful, very good, but 
but much more specific. It's not the Enneagram, which is nine. I can't keep track of all those in a conversation with another human being, all right? I'm not capable. Give me four, and I might be able to figure it out, okay? And the reason that I think this one in and of itself is so helpful not simply because of its application if you learn how to do it. So once again, I'm going to let you write this down in your notes because I think it's going to be helpful for you to after service to go take this test. It'll be a fun thing. Maybe you can do it over lunch with your family. But it's the DISC personality test. You can type it into Google. they got free tests you can take all over the place or the Gary Smalley personality test. Either of those uh, is the one you want to go to. But to that end, those are really very ancient in their connotation. Uh, literally back in 444, uh, is it A.D. or B.C.? How far? B.C. is what we're looking at on this one. Uh, there was a, a, a thought leader who came to this conclusion that all, there were four elements at play in the world at large, in everything, comprised everything. He was wrong, to be clear. Uh, he, it was earth, wind, fire, and water. Why did the band leave out water? I don't understand that. Did they lose a member early on? I don't know what happened. Maybe somebody could tell me later. But anyways, to that end, there was supposedly these four things. And from there, a lot of people back then believed that your personality and all that was brought on by external factors, meaning like these kind of elemental forces somehow determined how you were wired. Inaccurate. But to that end, as he began to postulate these things and the idea of psychology and ultimately personality began to form more clearly, these four began to be used in application therein. The four founding ones that you may have heard before if you've ever studied this sort of thing is choleric, sanguine, phlegmatic, and melancholic. Those are four pretty foundational approaches in thinking as to categorizing personality. Uh, the Myers-Briggs, for example, is 16 personalities because it's more or less four, 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 four. It's four breakdowns of each of these overarching umbrellas that we're going to talk about. So the disc itself uh, came out in the late 1920s is when it first was postulated, and there's been all kinds of iterations since then. But to that end, you fall underneath one of these categories. Now, typically, you've got a primary and a secondary. Some people are all a primary, uh, and it's like no other of the three. It's just that one. But it just depends, uh, and you'll find that out if you take the test, and it's real fun to have conversations with family about it because they'll be like, yeah, no, that's you. That is you. All uh, right? Uh, but to that end, here's what those are. So you've got, uh, if you're looking at the disc, for example, uh, you've got a number of different things in place. You've got dominant, inspiring, supportive, and cautious. And depending on which of those you are, I would tell you that if you are in a place of unhealth, when it comes to this idea of control, the way you try to control will look different than other people's. Let's dive in. I'll give you some examples of that. Uh, the first of which, which ties to that dominant personality or the lion one, if you're looking at the Gary Smalley one, is what I call the bully controller. If we're in an unhealthy spot and we find ourselves with that slant of a personality, this person's bullying can be ruthless. They say by their words or actions, I want what I want when I want it, and I will get it with your help over your lifeless body. Uh, right? Is that, you know, you're going to be, you're like, whoa, that sounds, and you're like, no, some of you are like, no, no, it sounds about right. Uh, you know, yeah. That is the way that some people will try to control. It is their way or the highway, and they will push, pull, bow up, and blow up until they get their way. How does this leave others feeling in the wake of this? It leaves others feeling intimidated, run over, hurt, incapable, and controlled. So that's one that any of us potentially, based on our wiring, could land with. That's the bully controller. Second one is the charismatic controller. And this is the inspiring personality or the otter personality. This person is a silver-tongued snake oil salesman is who they are, okay? They are one who's just dipped in honey and sweet tea. Like they just come to you and they are just saying all the right things in all the right ways. This person's often over the top, polite, pleasant, sweet, and sociable. But subtly, what you realize over time, and I'm going to tell you right, this one's the one that you don't realize it's happened until it's almost too late most of the time, unless you're just so used to experiencing it, is that you step into a conversation with somebody and you don't realize there's an underlying agenda because it's wrapped in such a sweet package. And uh, what will happen is, is by the time you find yourself on the other side, they will have coerced you into their way of thinking in an overt and uh, subterfuge-infused way. 
It's not a great one. It feels the best out of all four of them, I'll tell you that, because it just feels like it's real nice, but it's still someone subtly instilling some semblance of control. We initially respond positively to this until we sniff it out, and this ultimately leaves us feeling played, manipulated, and controlled. So there's that one, that's the charismatic controller. Uh, the next one's the martyr controller. This is the supportive or retriever personality type. This person's a martyr. They'll tell you to do what you want and that they don't care when every part of them from the tone of their voice to their nonverbal says otherwise. The hidden message is, if you care about me, then you will know what I want and do it or else. How this leaves others feeling helpless, like they're a bad person if they don't comply, like the relationship is in jeopardy if they don't comply, and ultimately it leaves them feeling control. The final one, which is the rigid controller, is based on the cautious or beaver personality. This person's rigid, emotionally cold, detail-oriented and efficient, and often perfectionistic. It's difficult to get close to them as they don't let down their guard easily. They have difficulty with teamwork and collaborative efforts as they believe they know best and automatically assume others will let them down. They will create elaborate systems that only make sense to them to force you into their way of doing things. How this leaves others feeling? It leaves them feeling trapped, without a voice, invisible, and ultimately controlled. So I'm really sorry to have triggered a, probably a whole lot of you internally right now uh, when it comes to this idea of control. Because I think what I just did for some of you is like, you're like, I've been controlled for a long time by this person. Like you just had that revelation because I got a little bit too specific, right? Like I got into the reality of what control can look like in your everyday life. You're like, that's my boss. That's my, you know, relationship that I'm in right now. That's the, right? So take a deep breath. Understand that they're human and they've got stuff they need to work on and also understand that if somebody, and I got to say this too, if somebody's trying to convey to you, hey, this matters, whatever this thing is, it doesn't mean they definitionally are trying to control you either, okay? You got to recognize the heart attitude in the way they're approaching it. So don't leave here and somebody be like, hey, I think we should go uh, to Culver's seat after this. And you'd be like, how about you stop controlling me? Like, that's not what I'm saying you need to go to in this right now. I see you, you're dying. You're trying to roll me over. All right? I'm not going to take it, all right? I don't want some cheese curds right now. Like, I know, I hear you, okay? No, not that, all right? It's in an unhealthy, balanced situation that we're talking about this idea of control. So what I want you to do as we prepare to dive into the Word is I want you to be real honest with yourself. Which of these things sounds the most like if you struggle with control, how you struggle with it? And in so doing, you will prepare yourself to properly address it as we seek God's guidance therein. So to that end, Isaiah 55, 8 says this. It says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. This is God talking to the prophet Isaiah in this, or more specifically to all of us as it applies throughout the ages. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God declaring that who He is, His power, His personhood, His wisdom, His deity, His everything transcends everything we are. And that is a fundamental reality that if we're going to walk on this faith journey, we have to come to grips with. And what that means is He's God, you're not. I'm not. And that's a difficult one to grasp when we want to be the God and controlling factor over our lives. Proverbs 19, 21, easily a top 10 verse for Seth, easily. I love this verse because it's deeply convicting in its nature and it's panned out in my life over and over and over again. Proverbs 19, 21, many are the plans in a person's heart. I'm gonna read that more personally. Many are the plans in Seth's heart but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Put your name right there in that verse. Many are the plans of insert your name. But I'm going to tell you right now, it's what the Lord would have that prevails over it all. To that end, 
Are we trying to exert control over our life as if we are God over our life? And the answer to that is a whole lot of the times, yes. And I don't want you to feel alienated in that. I want you to feel seen in that because we all do that all the time, okay? Like we all are like, no, no, no. Like I've got to figure it out. It's that you are even well-meaning at times when you inadvertently do it. But at the end of the day, if we take two steps back and assess it, we go, okay, I'm trying to put myself in the place of God and control whatever this is in my life into submission whenever I, in fact, should be in submission to God, which leads us to our first point, which is this. We've got to release control of our life to God. You've got to release control of your life to God. Now, that's a pretty obvious on-the-nose answer that preacher man's going to tell you, okay? You got to release control to God. But I'm going to tell you right now, if there's, there's a few different, I want to say, thematic, uh, powerful, foundational things throughout Scripture that if you could just get a few of those, I'm going to tell you it's going to change your life. This one is one of them, okay? Uh, and God has been revealing it, this one in particular to me, a lot in this new season of life. Even in transitioning into this role, this one is one I have had to deeply ingrain in my person if I want to walk faithfully and peacefully in myself and not feel debilitated, not feel like I have to exert some semblance of control for any self-perceived reasons. See, for some reason in life, we walk towards whatever is coming our way, and we just white-knuckle grip around whatever it is. Go, no, no, if I could just hold on, if I could just wrap my mind, wrap my arms around this thing, and just guide it where I need, and just wrestle it down, I, I think that will be good, because I'll have understanding of it fully, and I'll have control over it completely, and I'll know that I can make sure the outcome is how I wish it to be. One... That makes logical sense in our mind. When somebody watches us do it from afar, we look like we are crazy when we are doing that at any given moment. Trying to just force our life, force our situation, and in so many instances, force our relationships into a place that is self-perpetuated. Very damaging, very problematic. But to that end, if we could stop being so close-fisted and just gripping around things and walk like this, this imagery right here is the imagery I keep replaying in my head over and over again. I've been even talking about it to our staff over and over again. I go, hey, we're just going to walk like this to God in our lives, just giving it to Him, just releasing control to Him. I've talked about it in the past, but can I tell you, it is astounding to me how God shows up in your life when you walk like this. And it's also ridiculous to me that I have to say it's astounding. And why I mean that is this, and I've said this before, but why is it that we are so baffled that when we as people of God, as followers of Christ, walk forward and go, man, God, if you could just show up, if you could just do this amazing thing, if you could work in my marriage, if you could help me out here at work and give me some peace in a real messed up situation, if you could just move in this worship service right now, I just want to feel your presence, God. If you can blah, 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 blah. And then he shows up, we're like, that was crazy. Like, no, it wasn't. You asked for it. What'd you think he was going to do? Like, why are we so surprised? When we, as far as the guy, we go, I believe he's the God of the universe. I believe he's in my heart. I believe everything he did is true. And I asked for him to show up. And I was just like, good gracious, he came to the party. I gave him an invitation and he actually showed up. Like, yeah, that's how it works, friend. And I have realized that so many times in my life recently that when I just walk like this, he takes care of a whole lot of it for me in ways that I couldn't have and in ways that I desperately needed. But it takes this, and this mess ain't easy, okay? Because at any given moment, you and I will get in our way in so many instances as it applies to this. I tell you a big reason for this is we can be worriers, especially if you struggle with control, there's probably an element of worry at play in your life as it applies to those moments. I'll tell you, Scripture speaks to this over and over again, but here's a couple. Matthew 6, 34 says, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble its own. We've heard this verse before. 
right? Hey, friend, don't get so worked up about what Thursday's going to bring. You're still in the midst of Sunday, all right? And Sunday ain't over, all right? There's all kinds. You don't even know what Sunday evening's going to bring. Some of you are going to send me a, a message later, like, why'd you have to say that? Uh, right? It's, there's any number of things that life's going to bring your way, but you got to walk like this. You can't walk in worry because I'm going to tell you right now, I say it over and over again, a broken world filled with broken people find themselves in instances where brokenness is thrust upon them. So brokenness is in your future. I hate to break it to you. But the difference that is made if you're a follower of Christ is that you can walk like this and understand that the God of the universe is walking hand in hand with you in and through it. Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. One thing you will see consistently throughout the understanding of what it means to, one, not worry, not be anxious, and two, not step into issues of control in our lives, is that there is a counterbalance that is a very practical one that God gives to us, and that is the concept of thankfulness and thanksgiving. I did a whole talk specifically on that a year or two ago, uh, and to that end, I'm going to tell you right now, thankfulness is a game changer in your life if you can actively live it out. I've just weirdly been experiencing it inadvertently through trying to teach my child how to pray. So. Children, as you might imagine, really early on, the concept of prayer, pretty far-fetched to them, and they're trying to learn it, and let alone getting into the different types and ways that we can pray for things. But they can typically understand how to be, like, pray about being thankful for something. So what we do at meals is that we do that, and we kind of go hands together, and then we're eyes closed, and, and Finley, who's three now, she gets it, and she, she's all about it. She wants to lead out in prayer. Chloe doesn't know what the mess is going on, but she thinks we're paying patty cake, and she's like, look, and so she's, love, she's just having a good time. And then what has occurred that's real funny is Finley doesn't understand the cadence of prayer. Like, you can say all your prayers at once and amen once at the end. You don't have to say one prayer, amen. Let's all reset and recalibrate. Also say another prayer, then say amen. So we do like 19 prayers before we even get to eating our food half the time if we're doing prayer at mealtime. But I love it because what we've had is these weird moments of just really cool, thankful things because she's just sitting there in her little kid brain going through all the things that she wants to say she's thankful for. And there's so many things that we overlook and some of them are nonsensical, but at the same time, I love it. So I'll give you examples. So we're uh, praying uh, this past week before uh, dinner, and we're getting Finley to lead out as she does. And we say, Finley, can you pray? And so she always starts real quiet, mumbling, How's that? Jesus, wait, hey, first. Baby, we got to hear you. Can you speak up? Okay. Uh, and then she brings it up a level, and she goes, thank you for the food. Amen. Amen. And then we all say amen. All right. And then she points to the next person who's going to pray. She goes, Daddy, you pray. And I just go, okay. And then she tells you what you're supposed to pray about. She's real bossy. Uh, and, and so she, in that moment, will look at me. And I'm going to tell you, this is not a lie. So she just got done saying, thank you for the food. Uh, amen. And she goes, Daddy, you need to say what you're thankful for next. And she goes to tell me what I should say. This is not made up. She goes, Daddy, tell Jesus you're thankful for Star Wars. Tell him you are thankful for Star Wars. I was like, yeah, baby, we're going to do it. Thank you, Lord, for Star Wars. Amen. It is made in your image. Uh, I, I, love it. I love it. Hey, there's messianic undertones. It's a whole thing. It's a metaphor. You can look it up. Uh, it's good stuff. But then she goes into that, right? She's thanking the Lord for Disney princesses and for her Guy and Papa. That's what we call one of our sides of Grandma and Grandpa. Or Mimi, Cece, and Papa. That's the other one. Where, where do we come up with all these names for grandparents? But to that end, she's just going through all these names, all these people. And I'm just sitting there going, man, these are such things I overlook. But I am thankful for them. I'm thankful that my daughter can look at these things that I so quickly overlook and be incredibly thankful for them. Thankfulness is a powerful tool in our tool belt when it comes to fighting our need for control, especially in the face of worry and anxiety and all sorts of things. So let's move on to the next point that we've got. And we're going to see this thankfulness show up yet again. Colossians 3.15 says this, and this is a, this is a cool passage. We've got a couple of passages today I'm really excited about because of some specific word studies we're going to get into with them, and this is one of them. So Colossians 3.15 says this. It says, let the peace of Christ rule, and that's the word to focus on. So if you've got a copy of God's word or anything, just underline that word rule. We're going to look at it in detail here in a second. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace and be thankful. 
Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Does this verse sound familiar? If you've been with us for a couple months, it should. Uh, It is one of the focal verses that we had when we did the Heart of Worship series. And what I love to do, and I hope you enjoy it, is whenever we look at Scripture, the short answer is we do not have the time in this framework of, uh, you know, 30 to 40 minutes to look at a passage and get every single iota of what's going on in it. So I love to circle back and show you all that's going on from different angles. So we're not looking at this one right now through the idea of what it means to worship through songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. It's saying what I want you to focus on is the beginning of that passage right there. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Now, that word for rule is a Greek word, and it is blabuo, okay? And I listened to the recording a lot to make sure I said that right, and I just crushed it. Uh, But anyways, that word is blabuo, okay? And that word means to be an umpire, to control, and, and this is why it stands out to me as so significant, this is the only moment, instance, usage of that word in the entire Bible. This one time. And what it is speaking to, which is pretty cool to me, is the thing, arguably the only thing, that we should allow to control us. So I'm going to reread that verse even with that word control put in it. Let the peace of Christ control your hearts. Let it be an umpire. Let it be the thing that gives you guidance on what should and should not be. Let it control your heart, the peace of Christ. And I love that as you keep reading, it says, and be thankful. See, We've got to get to a place where we don't just do this, but then we say, okay, I give it to you, God, and now I want to be controlled by you, but I want to be specifically controlled by the peace that can only come in Christ Jesus. So two is pretty simple, is we've got to let the peace of Christ control us. Let the peace of Christ control you. If you're going to relinquish yourself to anything to control you, let it be that. And this peace is, is holistic. It's, it's both in a cerebral and spiritual sense of I have peace and security for eternity in the idea that Christ has died for me and I'm in a relationship with God now. But it's beyond that. It's in every facet and instance of our life that we go, you've got it all. I've already given it to you. So now control me with your peace. Well, scripture speaks to this in any number of places, the most obvious of which is when it says, hey, we need to have the peace that passes all understanding. And that's that idea that you've got a whole lot of nonsense you have to deal with in life in which peace and your understanding of what it should be like is such that you should not experience peace. Every part of your brain goes, peace does not belong here right now in my life. But supernaturally, Jesus steps in and instills in you peace. Now, I think there's a couple of ways that we find ourselves experiencing that. One is the very practical instance of uh, reflection and thankfulness we've already talked about. But secondarily is we have to walk open-handed and understand and pray to God. God, can I just tell you, I ain't got what it takes. And I really need for you to supernaturally step in and give me some peace right here. And, and when we do that, there's going to be moments in our lives where it is inexplicable. Now, it's not universalistic, meaning like you don't get just a like button that you get to hit when that happens and all of a sudden, whoa, every time you just feel peace, okay? But I'm going to tell you right now, there's pretty crazy moments that I've walked alongside people, even in recent days, where I look in their eyes and they should be destroyed, but for some reason they are not. They are broken but not destroyed because they know peace and they are controlled by the peace of Christ. So to that end, we should as well. Release control of God. Let the peace of Christ be the only thing that controls you. Galatians 6, 7 says this. It says, flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good. This is the emphatic part that I want us to look at. For at the proper time, 
We will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. I'm going to tell you right now, some of you, this is going to be your least favorite point. Uh, and the reason I know that is my least favorite point. So uh, that's why. It is deeply convicting. I do not like it, and I want it to change. It's not going to, so i got to give up on that. So, Lamentations 3. Top three passages for Seth. We got some good ones in this week that I really love. Lamentations 3 has walked me through some messed up stuff in my life. If you've never read it, read it before, you absolutely need to. Uh, start in verse 1, culminate that bad boy at verse 33. It's a game changer. Uh, but there's so much that happens here as the prophet Jeremiah is lamenting, crying out in anguish for everything he's had to go through in his life, okay? And there's so many things that he is processing in very visceral ways, ways, and here is one right here, that when he finally puts all this up that he's had to suffer through, and he reflects back on that, and he goes, man, I remember my affliction and my wandering, I remember it well, and I'm downcast. My soul is downcast within me, but this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Uh, great is the Lord's faithfulness and every morning. He goes on and on and on, and 24 right here is where we pick up that I want us to focus on, and it says, I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. I hate that word. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Psalms 27, 13 says this, uses that terrible word yet again. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I love, at 14, it reiterates it twice. Almost says the exact same thing over again as if God knows. I get it. Y'all are going to really struggle with this. Let me double down on it, okay? 14, wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Three is my least favorite point. And it is trust God's timing. And understand that it is not your timing. And 99.999999999% of the time, it ain't going to go the way you wish it would from a timetable perspective, okay? Everything in my life that has ever been worthwhile, I always wanted way faster than it happened, okay? Every single time. And every single difficulty I went through, I wanted to end way sooner than it did, all right? Every single time. And the idea is, is that His ways are not our ways. They are above our ways. And we can't see the full scope of the story right now, but He can. And I can tell you, every time I've looked back on those moments, I have been able to see God work in and through those things to instill in me great new development, sanctification, growing more and more like him daily, certainly if in any other way than to just simply walk that much more open-handed with my life. And beyond that, to see him refining me and developing me into who he would have for me and to reveal to me in his own timing the solution to whatever I find myself in the midst of. But I've got to do that terrible word, wait. And as we saw in Galatians 6, it says, for at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So three, we got to trust God's timing. Next passage we're about to read, which is uh, one of the ones that I was telling you is going to be a, a key word study, is this next one. And it's a really cool one. And the reason for that is, is that it's uh, 1 Peter 4. And uh, once again, a few weeks ago, we were studying through three weeks in a row, we looked at different passages in 1 Peter. And we looked at 1 Peter 4, and we looked at verses 1 through 11, uh, and what God was saying there. And we talked about uh, spiritual awareness and being ready and spiritually prepared for whatever life might throw our way. And that verse is where we ended, and 12 is about to be where we pick up right now in 1 Peter 4, 12. So it says this, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. So if you remember, 1 Peter's talking a lot about people who are dealing with persecution and issues and problems in their lives and in the early church. 13, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. All right, and so I'm going to pause there to prepare you for what he's about to say. So what he's done is he said, you're going to suffer. You're going to deal with issues. You're in a broken world. Brokenness is going to be thrust upon you, especially if you claim the name of Jesus. That's also going to get you into some trouble sometimes, okay? And you just need to be prepared for that. 
Just as he suffered, so shall we suffer. We talked about that when we studied that. But what's beautiful right here and really cool, practical, and a little bit in, uh, frustrating is that what occurs is that Peter goes, hey, but you shouldn't suffer for this. And so these are the things he's about to list is not suffering for. And the first few are going to be pretty obvious, like an oxymoron to you. The last one you're not going to like because I don't like it. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief. Thank you, Peter. We were struggling with that. Uh, I, I, he goes, a lot of times in Scripture, they'll do that. They'll just go real overt and obvious to make a point. You're like, obviously, we didn't, like, don't go to prison for killing somebody and be like, why am I suffering for your sake, Jesus? Like, no, you killed somebody. You're going to prison. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Go straight to prison, okay? That's what happens when that occurs. But to that end, what's going on is Peter's making a point with juxtaposition. So he says, you should not be as a murderer or a thief. You shouldn't suffer for these reasons or any other kind of criminal act. But here's the turning point for us in the word I want us to focus on. Or even, and this is the big like swing to a much more practical thing that we all struggle with at times. Or even as a meddler. And we're going to look at that word meddler because I don't know about you, but I haven't word, used the word meddler in a sentence in 20 years, and I feel like I need to understand what in the world that's supposed to be speaking to. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. That word meddler is, once again, a word that only occurs once in the entire Bible. And I'm going to do everything in my power not to butcher it, because it is crazy long. Like, we're talking, like... Uh, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious long, okay? It's like that type of stuff. And that's going to show you the nuance. It's just meddler, but this Greek word I'm about to try not to butcher is the word in which that means. Lord be with me. Uh, here we go. A lot reat piscopos. A lot reat piscopos. And that is darn near close to the right way to say that, okay? Uh, and to that end, that's what the word meddler means. Now, the meaning there is pretty powerful and for me and hopefully for all of us deeply convicting. See, that word means one who takes the supervision of the affairs pertaining to others but isn't wise themselves. Uh, a meddler in other people's affairs. When I was reading a commentary on this, there was a, a word given to what's going on here contextually that I found to be deeply convicting, not just for the early church, but for us even to this day. It says this, it says, the writer here seems to refer to those who with holy but intemperate zeal meddle with the affairs of the Gentiles. So they're saying those Jews at that time who were stepping into this new thing called the church and being a Christian, and they were meddling in the affairs of the Gentiles at large around them. So, uh, but in temperate zeal, meddle with the affairs of the Gentiles, whether public or private, civil or sacred, in order to make them conform to the Christian standard. Does anybody else see right there on full display so much of what we struggle with in this day and age? Like, and I, I, I'm just going to tell you right now, we've talked about this before, but it's the idea that we look at people, and it's just baffling to me. The logic is so flawed for us, but I look at someone who does not have the Holy Spirit, who does not care about Jesus, and I go, why don't you care about the things of Jesus? Your sin offends me. Like, and, the, and it's this whole thing. It's like, duh, like, no wonder they don't care, because why should they? If they have not been changed, if they have not been transformed by the renewing of their minds, as Scripture says, because the Holy Spirit has existed within them, because the whole Heart of Worship series says that because of who Christ is, their desire should now be to worship Him. We've got to first get them to a place where they care about worshiping Him. So to that end, 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 speaks to this as well. It says, now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. And to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands just as we told you. So that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders. And so that you will not be dependent on anybody. I love diving into scriptures that I think that not a lot of us have studied before. Sometimes these I think we get to, and I get to them as well. I'm like, that's in the Bible. Like, that's there. Like, that is told to us as followers of Christ. 
And when I talk about all the time that your life needs to demonstrate the transformed nature of your heart and the way you interact with people and the way you love them and the way you lead them, this is what it's talking about. Let the way you conduct your business be the gospel to others around you. And when the time comes, speak the gospel when you need to point to where it all came from in the first place. Now, does this disparage the idea of discipleship? No. It's the understanding that we have to get to a place where we're leading people to God. And then, and only then, can we expect them to care about being sanctified, namely becoming more and more like Jesus daily. So to that end, we've got to not control people into living Christian principles, but we've got to lead people to become Christians. Namely, we need to be the gospel. Point four is, and this is a wide spectrum of understanding of what this means, is don't try to control other people. This is the most obvious answer, which means don't, like in your family, don't meddle in other people's affairs in such a way that you think you just know better and you try to control them. Don't let one of those four negative manifestations of control institute itself in such a way that you are adversely affecting the people that you care about most. But also be careful that you're not trying to do it in such a way that you are damaging your ability to be the gospel in other people's lives. Show them why they should care. Show them that Jesus matters. And in the wake of that, then show them how to live it out. And let your life be the thing that speaks it the loudest. A heart that seeks to control others isn't in alignment with the heart of God. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 speaks to this, and this is a great verse to just think on and meditate as it applies to your very intimate relationships in your life, those that you would try to classify as love. 1 Corinthians 13 is arguably the most uh, prominent and overused verse uh, of love. Like every single wedding you've gone to, somebody read this, and if I was doing your wedding, I was one of those people. Uh, Every single time, because it's a powerhouse verse when it comes to love, but it says this, and there's one part of this that I think we overlook, interestingly enough. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. To love people well is not to insist on your own way, not to try to control them into submission. It is to be selfless in nature and love them well. Let's bring this bad boy home. Galatians 5.22. This is the one about the fruit of the Spirit. Some of you already might know where I'm going when I just say that. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and here's the one, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Proverbs 25, 28 says, like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. 2 Timothy 1, 7 says, for the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Hopefully that last one stood out to you. It's the verse I started this whole series with and have revisited over and over again and is a powerful capstone for us at the end of this. We have to, if we wanna step out of fear and understand the heart and spirit that has been put within us of God, it's not a spirit of timidity, of fear, of cowardice. It's one of great power one of love, and we just saw what love is. It doesn't presume to its own way, and self-discipline. So, do you understand, like, can I just point out the three things to you already, all right? So what I'm telling you is this. We've got to do three things at the end of the day when it comes to this idea of control. We've got to release control to God. We've got to stop trying to control others. And we've got to figure out how to control ourselves. So the verse thematically that I'm giving to us, that I'm walking through, and God's working in me, and I hope he works in you as well, in 2 Timothy 1 is this. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power. So what you need to hear is, is that the spirit that is in you, when you release control to God, when you let the spirit of God come in you, is first and foremost powerful to be there for you in and through whatever it is. And you don't have to control it because the power of God is in you and working through you. Secondarily, it's love and that he selflessly loves you, but he calls you to love, which means you don't control people in submission. You don't look at things in your own way and what you deserve. You walk in love. And finally, finally, what it looks like to not walk in fear is to be self-disciplined in who you are, namely to be self-controlled. Do you see how all of it stacks up and works together within scripture for our benefit? 
Man, release control to God. Don't seek to control others. Seek to love them for the sake of leading them to Jesus and work at sanctifying yourself daily so you can look more and more like him. Ask that question, what in this moment would worship Jesus? And can I tell you, if we walk in that way, we will have victory over fear in every facet of our life because we will walk in power and love and self-discipline. Let's be those people as we seek to love others well. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you that you are a God of goodness, that you are a God of love, that you are a God who transcends all things, is above all things, is above everything that I bring to the table. And I pray that you will step in and change us, that you will powerfully move in our lives in such a way that we can acknowledge the necessity to just open-handedly give things to you that we can walk forward faithfully knowing that we don't have to control our situation, the people around us, that you've got in your hand and in your timing, and that we can walk faithfully with great powerful peace in and through that. And I pray that you will give us the power that only you can to control and develop ourselves in our moments of weakness. We love you, Jesus. We release control to you. It's your name we pray. Amen.